to shift topics sure. again. You have sure, an, an amazing life. I wanted to tackle a bunch of different issues. Go so in, in your book, Viking Economics, mm-hmm. you discuss the Nordic model. Um, and people, people talk about the Nordic model that compared to the US and they ask, why can't we have this? Why can't our welfare state be as generous as, as the Nordic countries? But I think what you did in your book, which is really important, is teach how the Nordic countries were able to even accomplish this, the nonviolent direct action campaigns that were so essential. Uh, you discuss how the labor movement, which was inspired by Marxism, but mm-hmm. believed in coalitions, was able to form an alliance with farmers and workers engaged in strikes and boycotts. And in your own words, they essentially made the country ungovernable and forced mm-hmm. the government to implement these policies. Um, I think your work in this area uh, has greater resonance today in, in, in this month of October, which has been called Striketober, to the burst of labor strikes happening. 10,000 John Deere workers have gone on strike, 1,400 Kellogg workers, 30,000 Kaiser Permanente workers have threatened to walk out. Um, recent polling has shown more public support for unions than in decades. Um, in August, 4.2 million workers quit their jobs in what has been called the Great Resignation. <laughs> so I'm, I'm wondering, does this recent burst of labor activism give you hope that we can achieve a welfare state like the Nordic model? And what lessons can workers who are organizing in America learn from the history of labor activism in the Nordic countries? Right. Well, I also am thrilled by what's happening. I, I join you very much in that and consider it quite promising. Mm. How much it will be able to deliver? Well, we can learn something from the 30s. Mm. The 1930s was also a period of tremendous labor activism. And, uh, and it was parallel, and so roughly in time, parallel to what was going on in Scandinavia. But in Scandinavia, what they did was they pushed the economic elite out of domination. Mm. So the, the economic elite... Uh, while they weren't uh, there, they weren't expropriated. That is to say, their the banks that they owned and so on were, were, weren't taken away from them. They were told, "You're no longer running your, the country. You're no longer directing the economy. We are going to regulate you like crazy. We are running the country. We are setting the economic direction, and." And we're going to tax you like crazy too, and uh, tough, you know. But we're not taking away your civil liberties or something like that, <laughs> you know. So you can still have your political party, and you can still fight back. Um, but good luck because we're running things now. Okay, so that power shift is what we weren't able to pull in the 1930s, and can't at this moment in in, in our time either. Whether we can. Uh, coming coming up, whether we're we're now seeing a trend mesh that will that that might increase and increase and give us that power, mm-hmm. that's tantalizing. Okay, mm-hmm. so what would what would happen if labor continued to more and more uh, increase? Well, uh, as as you pointed out correctly, in the Nordic countries, coalition was was central to get the mass space. There weren't enough industrial workers, but workers plus farmers. Yes, that was critical mass. So the question for the workers, our, our workers today is, where did they get their coalition partners mm-hmm. to be able to, uh, so that's one, one question. I'm hoping that a, a lot, especially of the younger people brought up by the professional middle class, will see, uh, will, will see a coalition possibility there for them in advancing especially climate goals. And that's the importance of the Green New Deal, because the Green New Deal is really a vision. And remember, that's one of the things Scandinavians knew. You're not going to get something if you don't know what it is you're trying to get. (laughs) So you've got to have a vision, and you've got to be able to sell it in common sense terms so that lots of people can join, right? Not set it in esoteric, crazy terms, but real terms. Okay, so that's what the Green New Deal is. It's common sense terms. It can be described in common sense terms. And it's enormous, and it comes from the Sunrise Movement, uh, which really brought it forward. And that was 
the children of the professional middle class. I know because I taught them at Swarthmore mm. College. <laughs> so um, I know those young people. And they, uh, and they would love coalition with labor. And one reason why they designed the Green New Deal the way they did was in order to be able to make that make that connection. Mm -hmm. So that now then it gets very interesting and juicy for the labor movement, which is, are they willing to uh, risk the wrath of the Democratic Party, which has been their base, mm -hmm. in order to go for the Green New Deal? Because within the Democratic Party, there is this bitter struggle, not bitter yet, but anyway, the intense struggle between the, the you might say, the Biden-led center mm -hmm. and the left. Uh, well, whoever thought the, a socialist left would be the head of the Senate Budget Committee, right? So you can see there's already uh, the Democrats, have, the, the mainstream Democrats have had to give in, give in somewhat, somewhat, mm -hmm. somewhat, somewhat. So the question is, uh, how much uh, are uh, when, when push comes to shove, will labor be willing to say, okay, at the risk of getting the cent centrist, uh, the, the, the Democratic National Committee people very, very upset with us, um, we are going to go with these uh, young people and the climate people and so on, and that will be our coalition. And what we will lose in numbers, because they'll lose in numbers, I mean, right now, they're, you know, Democratic Party is a pretty broad, broad base, right? So they would narrow their base by giving up the uh, centrist and to the right. But what they might gain is, or what they would need to use for power in order to gain that would be increased nonviolent direct action. Mm. That's what the Nordics did, you see? So they didn't allow it just to be a parliamentary game. No, 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 no. It was in the streets, it was in the factories, it was in the, like that, in the shipbuilding, ship, shipbuilding first. That's where a lot of the struggle played out. So the question then for labor now becomes, uh, or I hope will become, uh, shall we risk the wrath of the center right of the Democratic Party in order to cotton up to <laughs> the Bernie people <laughs> and these young people and the folks who realize that the deal with climate requires radical solutions, not liberal solutions. Mm. Are we willing to team up with them and to Zach give us enough of a coalition so that if we pump up the direct action, we can wage a successful nonviolent revolution in this country, which would mean then pushing, pushing, uh, you know, pushing out the economic elite. If mm. the 1% can be pushed out of dominance, then we can have, uh, what the Scandinavians have. If we allow the 1% to continue to rule, then we can't because they won't permit it, obviously. They, they don't even want their billion, billionaires don't even want to be taxed. <laughs> 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 They're very out of sorts these days because yeah. Biden, Biden thinks they want that billionaires should be taxed. <laughs> So, um, yeah, so that, that's my analysis. And, and, and we, I'm as much on edge as you are to find out mm. how this plays out. <laughs> mm. Thank you for that. Um, uh -huh. I think you raise an interesting point. I think one thing that's apparent from the writing that you've done and one thing that I've really been reflecting on in my time at Nonviolence International is you know, when we think about politics, we think about like electoral politics, you know, winning elections, working on campaigns. And I, I've, I, have, I was a political science major. That's what I've been super involved in. But I think that as the Nordic example shows, it's not just the struggle in the ballot box, it's the struggle in the streets too. And nonviolent direct action is, will be vital um, for the Green New Deal, for achieving labor rights, for taking power from the 1%. We'll, we're really going to need a lot of nonviolent direct action. So, did you by any chance see the movie about uh, Dr. King? There's a, there's a, a, yeah, there's a movie um, uh, for, from Montgomery Selma, something like that. Maybe mm. five years ago, eight years ago, mm. a movie 
by that amazing woman director, African American mm. woman director, whose name is escaping me. Uh, yeah. But anyway, that movie is especially revealing because mm. it shows a scene with Lyndon Johnson in the White House and Martin Luther King confronting him. And Lyndon Johnson is chewing him out for giving him such a hard time. And Dr. King is basically saying, what do you mean? You are not going to get away. I'm not going to let you do your usual manipulation, your master politician manipulation, because I have the people on my side. And we are going to make trouble for you until you give in. And Lyndon Johnson was, you know, famous as the ultimate manipulator who could stay on top of everything. He couldn't stay on top of Dr. King. And King knew that was not the reason, that it was not, not, not because King was an equal manipulator. It was because King had the people doing nonviolent direct action in Selma at that very moment. Mm -hmm. And it is direct action that creates the power that enforces politicians like Lyndon Johnson's to do the right thing. Mm -hmm. And if it's not, if, if you can't amass that power to force that, they won't do it. They just won't. Right. They just won't. Mm -hmm. yeah. No matter how many votes are cast, they won't. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Lyndon Johnson got, what, one of the largest pluralities of, of votes for president of anybody mm -hmm. ever, and mm -hmm. <laughs> except for Franklin Roosevelt. Yeah. <laughs> and Votes, so what? You know, I'm yeah. in charge. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I think I think that is especially timely now with the reconciliation bill, Joe mm -hmm. Manchin and Kirsten Cinema holding up um, mm -hmm. important priorities. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So the last topic that I wanted to talk to you about was the LGBTQ rights movement which I know is a deeply personal issue for both of us. Um, I was wondering, what was your experience like organizing for gay rights in the 1970s and 1980s? And like, did you ever lose hope that the struggle was winnable? No, I didn't. And that's because of people coming out, mm. which is why I was so moved by your article. Thank you. Um, there, there are what Gene Sharp counted 198 methods, <laughs> and, mm -hmm. and now there's Michael Beer's new book with even more methods. Uh, so there are all these methods, there are all these tactics that can be used in nonviolent direct action. But one of the very special things of, that LGBTQ people bring to the method tape the list, the tactical list, is the tactic of coming out. Mm -hmm. And who would think just saying who you are could be a nonviolent direct action tactic? Mm -hmm. But it was so powerful. So you ask what it was like for me in the 70s and 80s. That's what I saw around me over mm -hmm. and over and over was the enormous power. And I'd been, you know, I'd been going to jail for this and that and the other thing and thinking, well, that's a pretty powerful thing to do, right? Yeah. But when I came out to a thousand Quakers in a field house at a conference, mm -hmm. Whoa! That was like, whoa! You know? <laughs> Talk about the social power released mm. by a single person's single act. I mean, it, it was just extraordinary. Uh, so that also gave me then energy, positive energy, and optimism because more and more people were coming out. People were inspiring each other, right? So once I came out, other people came out. I wasn't the first, actually. I'd been inspired by other Quakers who'd come out who weren't well-known. I happened to be internationally known, so my coming out was like, da -da 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 -da. but uh, then, of course, many more people came out, so on, so on, so on. So it had that impact, and, um, and that kept, I think, the energy going. Mm -hmm. It was also, by nature... Um, an, an act on the offensive. That is, most people who came out weren't like, you know, caught and then da -da, you're out. It was much more, this person's coming out. They're announcing themselves, which is going on the offensive, right? There's all this temptation to stay hidden because you can, right? So um, that being on the offensive was also became the theme of the movement as a whole with regard to gay marriage, all kinds of issues. It would be 
onward, onward, onward. Let's go for the next thing. And uh, the, and the the, the, uh, the 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 homophobic establishment kept thinking with each concession that was made. Well, now that will surely be sufficient. Mm. <laughs> <laughs> and then gay people. And now we want to adopt your children. You know? <laughs> <laughs> and now we want to do this, and now we want to do that, and now we want to get married in the cathedral, and now we want to do, and boom, 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 on the offensive, on the offensive, on the offensive. And that is, of course, a winning strategy. I referred earlier in this interview to that very period in the 1980s when other movements, major movements, way bigger than our movement, like labor movement, like civil rights movement, way bigger than our movement, we're going on the defense and because of the Ronald Reagan pushback. We were going on the offense. Mm. And they, no, not gay marriage. How about army? We want to be in your yeah. army. Not the army! The very center of the patriarchy! <laughs> <laughs> no, no, no! You know, like that. Boom, 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 like that. And that staying on the offensive, of course, was brilliant. Mm. And it's the only way to win. So all those major movements that lost ground since, think of the women's movements losing ground mm -hmm. with regard to the right to choose. Mm -hmm. The number of children you have. Losing ground, losing ground, it's still losing ground because it's still on the defensive. Mm -hmm. That's the way to lose, folks. Be on the defensive. I do not understand a single leader in social change today that doesn't understand this. Most of the leadership is still inclined to go on the defensive when mm. somebody says boo. <laughs> we weren't. Somebody said boo, we said in your face. <laughs> and we won, 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 and continue to win. And we will continue to win as long as we do that. Now, mm. there are times when, uh, you, I think you pointed out to me in a letter, perhaps uh, there were some trans people who were on the defense in mm. some state or other, maybe Texas or something, with regard to something coming at them. And again, um, I would just ask them, look at your tradition. Your tradition is to go on the offense. So figure mm. out some way to go on the offense when mm. somebody's doing, because they're going to push. I mean, their job is to push. Right? Right. So your job is to go on the offense. Choose a goal that you haven't achieved yet. Mm -hmm. Don't just, don't, don't think about defending previously achieved goals. No, mm -hmm. that's the wrong thing. That's the labor mistake. That's the women's movement mistake. That's the civil rights mistake. Don't make that mistake. Do what your brothers and sisters did, your, your siblings did <laughs> years before, and go on the offensive. Find another marker that's farther that we don't have yet, you don't have yet. Go for that. Yeah. That's, that's the spirit uh, that, that win. It doesn't mean, of course, that every time you go out, you win. Right. What it means is the movement stays alive and stays moving forward, and then you do win. Yeah, that's a great point. I think, you know, when you talk about going on the defensive, I remember recently during the Trump administration, there was this whole idea of resistance and so sort of mm -hmm. this roman romanticization mm -hmm. of resisting. Uh. Horrible. <laughs> yeah. Horrible. The Nation Magazine did that. They practically mm. put it on their basket. Mm. I was outraged at the Nation Magazine. Mm. I didn't even bother. I submit articles to them once in a while, and I didn't even bother. Yeah. I thought, what a, what a crock of shit. We're supposed to <laughs> romanticize the resistance as if we're, now we're in, you know, occupied France <laughs> by Germany and World War II or something like that. Very romantic. Thank you. I'd rather win. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and and there is some age correlation there i mean older people are more likely to go into this resistance mode mm -hmm. they are i mean that's my observation right i'm 83 mm -hmm. years old i've seen a lot of older people do a yeah. lot of stuff that didn't <laughs> make sense and uh and some well, sometimes we do do stuff that makes sense but no, no, no. And then it takes a new generation of young people to come along and say, oh, what, what, you know, what's, this is very boring right now. We been, better do this. But this keeps happening, keeps happening. Older people, wake up. Stay on the offensive. If you can't stay on the offensive, at least shut up. <laughs>
<laughs> Follow the young people. <laughs> Oh God! I loved Gandhi's Gandhi's picture mm -hmm. of his future, which mm -hmm. was to live to what 140 or something like that, <laughs> and keep organizing campaigns. You know, and when it came time for him to take state power, as Mao, had, you know, all the all the great leaders of their people have, you know, George Washington, they all take state power, right? He's supposed to take power. He didn't, he didn't take state power. No, no, no. I w I want to stay a private citizen so I can keep lead on the offensive. Mm. and leave the class struggle. I neglected the class struggle because we had other things going on. And I put the national struggle first. Okay, so we won the national struggle. Now we're our own nation. I want to lead the class struggle. And I want to go, go, go. That was Gandhi's attitude. I, I, that was one of the things when in graduate school, I was taking Gandhi seriously and reading as much as I could of his work. It really blew me away. What an attitude, an old man determined to stay on the offensive. What a model. <laughs> I, think, I think that is a great note to end our conversation on. Um, Professor Lakey, thank you so much for speaking with me today. I've learned so much from this conversation. Several things you've said have blown my mind and inspired me. So thank you for sharing your thoughts with us and with Nonviolence International's YouTube channel. Uh, thanks for such great questions. And thanks for your very receptive face. <laughs> Zoom can be a, a kind of boring for me, and it obviously wasn't at all. It was because of your wonderful mm. face. Thank oh, you. Thank you. If you think these conversations are important and would like to see them continue, please consider supporting NVI and the work we do by subscribing to this YouTube channel, following us on Twitter and Facebook, and visiting our website. Also, please consider donating to our organization. Every little bit counts to help build a more just and nonviolent world.